Welcome to New City Church Online. We're thankful that you're joining us for this week's broadcast and to listen to today's message. My name is Eric, and I'm the lead pastor at New City Church. And if you're a regular attender of New City Church, or maybe this is your first time, we're glad that you're here. But especially if this is your first time, we're so thankful for the person that shared this video with you or they invited you to watch this video. Uh, we're just glad that you're here with us, and we hope to meet you one day in person so that we can connect with you, get to know you better, get you plugged into ministry, and help you follow Jesus. But for everybody watching today, I really do pray that this message is encouraging when you need some encouragement, that it's challenging if you need some challenge uh, put forth by God's Word today. We hope that it, it points you closer to Jesus. So I want to jump into our scriptures today. We're getting towards the end of our series that we are calling The Gospel According to David. The Gospel According to to David. We've been looking at different life events in the life of David and, and pointing them towards Jesus, towards what Jesus would have us become. We learn a lot from David and what he uh, was able to do under the grace of God and under God's choice to choose him to be king. And, and really, David's life is marked by what our lives should be marked by, because our lives are all about our obedience in response to God's grace. And that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time today, how we respond to God in obedience. And we're going to see that today when David has a critical decision to make and how he responds in obedience. See, David, uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 24. So if you're following along, go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. But at this moment, I want you to see where we're going to go today. I'm going to give you the big idea just to deposit it right into your heart. David, in, in what we're going to see today, David refused to take matters into his own hands, and he chose to obey God's way, even when it meant his personal suffering. So what does that mean for us? See, when you and I choose to obey God, we can rest assured that he will accomplish his purposes for us no matter what. We're going to see today that David, when opportunity even presented itself, Refuse to take matters into his own hands. And that's my challenge for you today. When you could take matters into your own hands or choose to obey God, what will you choose? And so I hope today, learning from the life of David, that you don't take matters into your own hands, that maybe you would pause and you would listen and that you would obey God. So let me take you to our story today. 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 and 2 simply says this. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines... He was told, David is in the desert of en -Gadai. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. Now, I want to catch you up on the story since we last met. Last time we talked about David defeating Goliath and being secure in his identity. He was about to step into what God had for him. But when that happened, you need to understand that David was almost immediately thrusted into the public eye. He became very popular. He started to serve in Saul's army. He got quite the reputation as a brave warrior. Things for David would start to change, almost accelerate to what God had for him. And it would say this about David and about Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 18. It says, When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with tambourines and lutes. As they danced, they sang, now pay attention, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And it says here, and from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. We're going to start to see things unravel and unfold and things get more difficult for both Saul and for David. In the chapters that would follow that bring us all the way to chapter 24, we, we would begin to see that Saul is suffering with jealousy. He even becomes obsessed with eliminating David. He sees him as a threat. He sees him as a threat to his kingdom, to his throne, and he doesn't know what to do other than act out in jealousy. At the same time as Saul's acting out in jealousy, the people in the kingdom are beginning to realize that God has chosen David to become the next king of Israel, not Saul, not even Saul's children. He's going to gain support from the people. There would be men who would be mighty warriors that would begin to follow him around and protect him and fight alongside him. 
because David's life would be threatened many times. And because that would happen, David and his men would flee the city of Jerusalem and they become fugitives on the run. He's got hundreds of supporters following him and they're also feeling like fugitives. So we come all the way to chapter 24, realizing that as soon as David is about to step into what God has for him, life gets more difficult. We learn that David and his men, they have encamped in a small range of caves and cliffs. And to be tactical, to be smart, they didn't all stay in one place. They spread out amongst these caves to be, avoid being captured or killed. It's, it's a difficult time for David, as we can imagine. I mean, he, remember, he's the chosen king of Israel. We have established that in this series. He, he spent, like a few weeks ago, we realized he spent a lot of time after being chosen that he would be okay waiting and preparing his heart and his mind for leadership. He didn't waste that time. Even last week when we talked about his big battle with Goliath, he remained secure in his identity when nobody else thought he could do it. He began to step into what God had for him, and now all of a sudden, this next chosen king is a fugitive on the run from the very king who he is supposed to replace as the next king of Israel. It's a difficult time for David. And in this time, we actually get a glimpse, sometimes very rare in history, we get a glimpse into what David might be feeling because while hiding in these caves, David would actually author two psalms that we have in the book of Psalms. Psalm 57 and Psalm 142. Let me give you a glimpse as to what David is feeling in this moment. Psalm 57 would tell us, Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me, for in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sent his love and his faithfulness. You have to imagine how, how much of a dark place you must feel that you are in to say, I can only take refuge in God. He's going to fulfill his purpose for me. He's going to send something from heaven to save me because there are people who are pursuing me. He calls it a disaster. Well, Psalm 142 would go further to describe what he's feeling he would cry out and he would say, Lord, listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me. He's talking about Saul and his 3,000 men, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. He feels like he's in prison. He says, then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. Most of David's Psalms end up praising God again because he, he trusts God. He knows God's going to get him out of this situation, but he's also very honest about how he feels. It's a disaster. It's a prison. He can only take refuge in God. He doesn't even feel safe in this cave. He, he needs God to send help from heaven. He's in a desperate situation. So, so King Saul has 3,000 men with him, and he is so sure that he has trapped David now in this valley and that he can end this threat to his kingdom. In Saul's mind, it's over. I've got 3,000 men. David maybe only has about 300. I'm going to find him. I'm going to end this threat. It, it seems like the odds are stacked against David, and that's all. it's all over for this next chosen king. But then the story, listen to me, you've got to see this with fresh eyes. The story takes a very strange turn, and it would simply tell us in verse 3 that he, Saul, came to the sheep pens along the way, and a cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself, to use the bathroom. David and his men were far back in that cave, in that same cave. Now listen to me. Put, put some perspective on this. For some odd reason, the king, who we know has 3,000 men at his disposal to fight for him, but to also protect him, this king, with all of these men at his disposal, he decides to go alone into a cave to relieve himself. And it just so happens that in a valley of caves, he goes to the very same cave that David and some of his warriors are in, and they've decided to hide in that cave, and here comes Saul. Listen to me, this just doesn't happen. It's very rare that a powerful king like this would go anywhere alone, especially on a mission like this. To, he's there to kill somebody who he thinks is a threat. Why would he go anywhere alone? From the outside looking in, though, follow this. This looks like a perfect opportunity for David to now turn the tables on King Saul. He could kill him, and he could finally take the throne. In fact, David's men, just a few men that are with him in that same cave, they see what's happening, that Saul is alone. And this is what they say in verse 4. The men said, this 
is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. See, while King Saul was in a vulnerable position, David's own men encouraged him, go ahead, take this opportunity. It's a sign from God that you can get the throne that's been promised to you. This was the moment where David could kill the person who had been trying to kill him. This was the moment where David and these men could finally go home and they could stop being fugitives. The thing is, is that God never actually said this exact statement. These men were probably offering their own interpretation of a previous event. Maybe they were referring to when David was uh, anointed as king or when uh, Saul's son Jonathan would predict that David would one day become king and that God would deliver his enemies into his hand. See, when David's men saw King Saul entering that cave, they wrongly assumed that this was an indication and an opportunity from God for David to take matters into his own hands to act and to kill the king. Now let me ask you before we move on to the next part of the story, has that ever happened to you? Has it ever happened to you? Has it ever seemed like something was too good to be true that everyone else around you assumed that this must be an indication from God himself? But did you feel the same way? I mean, did you at least try to pray about it first before you followed the assumption from other people? See, I think too often we do that. We listen to other people before we even bring it to God. But I want you to know that David's identity was secure in his relationship with God. And I want you to see what happens when David is presented almost on a silver platter with the opportunity to take what has been promised to him. It says in verse 5, Then David crept up unnoticed, and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, here it is, David was conscience-stricken. Conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. David doesn't kill the king that's been trying to kill him. I mean, did you, did you hear that? David doesn't kill the king that's been trying to kill him. Instead, he resolves to trust the Lord that God's going to carry out his plan in his way, and then he tells his men to do the same thing. See, I want you to see in this very small interaction, David still respected the position that Saul held as God's anointed king. He may not have had a lot of respect for Saul, but he had respect for the position that Saul was in because he was chosen by God. He knew, he knew right away that he was conscience stricken. He knew right away that it wasn't right to strike down this king and to take the throne for himself, even though all of us are agreeing with these men. Here you go, David, take his life. He's trying to kill you. You know what David could have done? He could have taken the shortcut. And none of us probably would have batted an eye at it. We would have agreed with him. But if he had taken that shortcut, I want you to know it would have diminished his trust in God. This shortcut, yeah, maybe it would get him the throne now, but it would have cost him in the end. See, David had a desire to obey God, and that desire overturned what could have been a very impulsive and very destructive solution to this problem. It would have ramifications that would probably be felt for years to come. Think about it. If David, the man after God's own heart, God's chosen king, decides to murder the king that's been chosen and anointed by God, he chooses to murder that man. What does that say about him? That he steps ahead of God. That if any of his followers think he's not doing a good job or they think they're chosen, it opens the door for maybe a future assassination attempt for David. But we don't know this, but David had a, had a moment. He was conscience-stricken. And he said, no, there, there's something about this situation. I can't get ahead of God. See, David's goal, we all know, it was to be king. So his men are sitting there, and they're urging him to kill Saul when he had the chance. David's refusal, listen to me. Some of you need to hear this. David's refusal was not an example of cowardice. It's actually an example of courage because he had the courage to stand up against the group and to do what he knew was right. Sometimes you're going to have that moment where everybody else around you, they may even be God following people who have your best interest in mind, who think that this is the opportunity that God has for you, but you are going to be conscience stricken and you have to stand up to them and say, I need to obey God. 
So you can't compromise your moral standards by giving into group pressure or taking the easy way out. See, it would go on to say that David would actually make himself known to Saul and, and tell Saul, like, listen, I, I didn't kill you. I had the opportunity. And, and you're all wrong about me. I, I'm not jealous of you, King Saul. I'm not trying to take over your throne. I don't have violence against you. Everything that you believe about me is wrong. I, I had the opportunity to take your life and because I respect you and because I know that you're God's anointed, I, I chose not to take your life. And listen to Saul's response. It's all the way down in verse 17. He says this, you, David, you are more righteous than I, Saul said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me of the good you did to me, but the, and the Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. And then he, he kind of says the logical thing. When a man finds his enemy, does he not let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king. First acknowledgement from Saul. And that the kingdom of Israel be, will be established in your hands. What a moment for Saul to realize that maybe he was wrong. See, with this choice to obey God instead of acting on his impulses, Saul recognized something in David. He recognized that David's heart was upright before the Lord. Can people say that about you and how you respond? See, Saul realized even in this moment, man, that, that his own heart was his primary problem and the cause of him falling out of favor with God. He realized in that moment, David made the right choice, and I've, I've made wrong choices. And he even says, surely you will be king, and Israel will be established. You see, even as David's enemy, Saul acknowledged God's blessing on David's life. See, David refused, refused to take matters into his own hands. He chose to obey God's way. Listen, even when it meant his personal suffering, the story would go on, and the Saul would continue to pursue David, and David again, a second time, would spare Saul's life. See, when we obey God, we can rest assured that he's going to accomplish his purposes for us, no matter what we might face. It's not always the easy way, but it's the right way because it's God's way. So I want to ask some questions because, I mean, what does this encounter in Scripture mean for us? It shows us the importance of obedience, yes, but there's so many nuances that are happening in this encounter between David and Saul. The first thing I, I would challenge all of us with is, is what does this mean for us? Well, I would say first challenge is that we've got to pay attention to the tension. Pay attention to the tension. It says there in verse 5, it says, Afterward, David was what? He was conscience-stricken for having just cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He didn't even hurt him. He, he felt guilty for even touching him. See, li listen to me. Everyone, everyone, believe that David should have just killed the king who was trying to kill him. Everyone knew that he was the next king of Israel and that the throne rightfully belonged to someone like him. Even King Saul would acknowledge that David was a righteous man, that he would be the best choice to lead Israel, that Israel would be established under his leadership, that Israel would see the next phase of their greatness. All of this is true, but however, in the midst of all of that emotion, everything building up, all the expectation that people had for David, there was tension in David's heart, and he paid attention to it. There was a moment where David could feel the emotion of the moment, and he did not ignore what was happening. We have got to pay attention to the tension. So let me ask you, what will you do when you are faced with a similar experience or a similar decision? Will you pay attention to the tension? See, I think for a lot of us, most of the time when we're faced with a tough decision on whether or not to obey God or, you know, we, we ignore the assumptions and maybe the expectations of other people, whether or not we, we, we find ourselves in the middle, obey God, ignore the assumptions, the expectations of others. What, what do I do? See, you know what there's going to be? There's going to be tension in our hearts. And I would say don't ignore the tension. I would say that the tension most of the time might just be the small, still voice of God. And if you need to, take a pause. Take a pause before you act. Take a pause before you make the decision. When you pay attention to the tension, you begin to acknowledge and strengthen your trust in God, even for a moment. 
you could put yourself in a place where you would avoid an impulsive and a destructive solution to your problem. Because here's what happens. I think too many of us pay more attention to our emotions when we're faced with a tough decision instead of just paying attention to that tension in our hearts. You know what that tension is? That's our conscience that God has given us by the power of the Holy Spirit. It says David was conscience-stricken. The Holy Spirit spoke to him in a moment and he paid attention to it. He didn't let his emotions or the expectations of others or the assumptions of others get in the way. He paid attention to the tension. What could happen in our lives if we allowed ourselves to be more conscience-stricken and if we paid attention to the tension? What else can we learn from this encounter? The second thing is that we cannot take the place of God in situations like this. We can't. See, David could have taken upon himself the decision to judge Saul's heart like we all are. Saul's a, an evil guy. The favor of God is not upon him. He could have taken upon himself the decision to judge Saul's heart. He could have made the decision his to end Saul's reign as king in that moment. And if we're honest, we wouldn't have batted an eye at it. But by doing so, David would have assumed, he would have assumed that he had all the wisdom and all the power of God. And that's a detrimental attitude. But instead, you know what David did? He not only paid attention to the tension, but he trusted the Lord. He didn't take the place of God. Because God's really the only one that, that truly knows what's in another person's heart. I, I want to read to you the decisions that after he paid attention to the tension, listen to how David acknowledges that he's not in charge. It would say in verse 6, David said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. He's saying it's not my decision. I, I can't take control of this. That's God's anointed one. Not, I didn't make that decision. Verse 12, May the Lord judge between you and me. He's saying this to King Saul. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. He's acknowledging, he's like, listen, I, I think God's going to have to judge between you and me. I'm doing things that I think are right. You're doing things that you think might be right, but the Lord is going to avenge all the wrong that you've done to me. But even if he doesn't, and, and even if you know, I'm really upset about all the ways that you've wronged me, he says right there, my hand's not going to touch you. I'm not going to take control. And then even in verse 15, again, to Saul, David says, may the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. He's acknowledging that he is not in control, but God is. See, all of David's men think that this is the moment where David can become king and kill the guy who's been trying to kill him. He can be the king. All of the running away can be over. Everyone knows that he's the next king anyway. So why not just take control? However, this wasn't the story that David wanted to tell. And that's not what God had in mind. If we're honest, that's not what God would have in mind. See, David made the choice to pay attention to the tension. And he made the choice not to play God in that moment. Could you imagine long term how that would have played out in David's life? David murders Saul. Not even guaranteed that he would have all of the uh, support going back to Jerusalem. People would be uh, maybe upset and wouldn't want him to be king. Maybe his own men might turn on him. Saul's men might turn on him. Remember, there's 3,000 people outside who might be pretty angry that, they, that he killed the king. He would force his way into the throne. It reminds me of the Shakespearean play, Richard III, which tells the true account of Richard III, who was like 15th in line to the throne of England, but he eliminated everybody on the way, and nobody trusted him. That, that could have been David's fate, that he would begin to just do whatever he wanted to do to get the throne instead of trusting God. Could you imagine David's grandchildren asking him the story? Grandpa, how did you become king? Well, King Saul was in a cave. He was going to the bathroom, and in a very cowardly way, I snuck up behind him, and I slit his throat, and I became king. What does that teach? What legacy is he leaving? What a, what a conscience-stricken moment for David to say, you know what? I, I'm not God in this moment. See, he acknowledged this. Listen to this. God was the one who put Saul on the throne, and it was not up to David to remove him from the throne. He did not want to step in the place of God. David didn't even try to predict the outcome in his head by playing God. He surrendered and he obeyed because he paid attention to the tension in the midst of everything. David did not force his will because he always wanted to honor God's will. 
So let me ask you, what story do you want to tell with your obedience to God? What story will the next generation be interested in hearing about how you chose to follow God? Or did you impose your own will? Will you have the testimony to share with other people that you paid attention to the tension and you didn't force your own will? See, when you and I obey God, we can be sure that he will accomplish his purposes for us. We pay attention to the tension We don't take the place of God in any situation. And and I think another thing we can learn from this is that our maturity, well, it's determined by our heart's attitude in obedience. Our maturity is determined by our heart's attitude in obedience. I mean, think about it. What does our heart reveal in our obedience to God? What, What does our heart tell other people? I mean, maybe you obey, but do you obey begrudgingly with a horrible attitude? almost rolling your eyes saying, well, this is what God had me to do. I didn't really want to do it this way, but praise the Lord, I'm going to do it anyway. Do you begrudgingly obey him? Or maybe do you just make the choice to disobey because you've chose your own way? Or do you trust God so much that you get to the point where you gladly obey him because you trust him? So how do we know if we have the wrong attitude? Well, I think we can recognize a bad attitude in all of this with our tendency to complain if and when things get tough. See, I think a lot of us think our spiritual maturity is determined by our religious activity. Let me say it again. Some of us think that our spiritual maturity is determined by our religious activity. We think you're spiritually mature because we have almost perfect church attendance, that we know the right Bible verses, that we know all the answers to all the religious questions. We might even think that our spiritual maturity is determined by how long we have known Jesus. But I want you to know that these factors, they don't determine how much we have grown or how mature we are in our spirituality. Those aren't indicators. In fact, the Bible would be a very clear way to gauge our maturity. They would talk about, the Bible would talk about our attitude when we suffer because maybe we've obeyed God. The book of James would put it this way. He would say, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. What a gauge of spiritual maturity, how we respond when things get tough because we're following Jesus. If anyone ever told you that when you give your heart to Jesus, when you choose to follow Jesus, that life all of a sudden will get easier, they weren't telling you the whole truth. Yes, you now have hope again. You have peace again. You have joy in your heart. But Jesus said, listen, in this world you will suffer. James is saying, listen, you're going to face trials of many kinds, but you've got to consider it joy because of the outcome. Because he's saying the fruit of our obedience is going to be worth the pain of the process because God is with us. Let me say it again. The fruit of our obedience is going to be worth the pain of the process because God is with us. Now, I'm a Philadelphia 76ers fan. If you're watching this broadcast, unfortunately, they lost last week on Father's Day. What a great Father's Day present to all the fans out there and didn't make it to the next round of the playoffs. And I remember a few years ago, the phrase was trust the process that the general manager of the team told us as fans that, listen, there's going to be a process where we're pretty much going to look like we're losing on purpose so that we can get good players, that we're going to build from the ground up, and, and eventually all of that pain of the process is going to be worth it because there's going to be fruit to show for it that we're going to have an NBA championship. Well, it hasn't happened yet, but I can tell you that it's going to be worth it, that the process will finish one day when we bring home an NBA championship. Now, why do I say that? Listen, There's going to be a process that we're going to go through when we obey God. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be easy. In fact, believers are kind of promised the opposite, that we're going to suffer because we obey God. I think now more than ever, Christians who obey the Word of God, obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit, it's not easy. But our obedience is going to bear its fruit one day. It's going to be worth it. Because you know what God wants to do? He wants us to make us, He wants to make us mature and complete. But he doesn't want to keep us from all the pain and the tough decisions. Sometimes we've got to learn on our own. So here's what we need to do. Instead of complaining about our struggles, I think our maturity will be seen as we look at all of those trials, look at all that suffering, look at all of those tough choices of obedience. That's an opportunity for growth. Our spiritual maturity is really determined by our heart's attitude in our obedience to God. So we listen. We pay attention to the tension. We, we can't become God in these situations. We let him do what he's going to do. But also, our attitude and our heart has to be right as we obey God. We can't be complainers 
We can't be the woe is me kind of person. We can't walk around as a suffering person all the time saying that I'm suffering for Jesus. Yes, we will suffer, but it's going to bear its fruit eventually if we don't give up. So here's my question as we end our time today. When you're faced with a tough decision, like David, when you're faced with a tough decision, what are you going to do? Will you pay attention to the tension in your heart? Will you take a moment to pause and allow yourself to feel that? Allow yourself to tap into your God-given conscience so that he will help you make the right decision as you obey God. Will you do that? Let me ask you this. What story do you want to tell about your, your track record of your obedience to God? What a beautiful testimony you'll have for generations to come. Will you have the testimony to share with others that you paid attention to the tension and you didn't force your own will? You trusted God and you said yes even when it was difficult. What will your attitude be when you will suffer because you've obeyed God? Will it be begrudging and complaining? Or will it be, you know what, I trust God, so if he's asking me to do it, I'm going to obey. See, I want to get back to the story, because eventually it would come to pass that eventually King Saul would actually end his own life. When he's faced with an overwhelming defeat, he realizes the kingdom is slipping away, He, he ends his own life. And David would be quickly declared as the new king of Israel. However, in the moment in the cave that we're talking about today, God never showed up and told David, hey, just I, I need you to trust me. You don't need to kill Saul now because everything is going to work out in the end. You're going to be king. It's going to be wonderful. I'm going to establish great borders and great influence through Israel. Just I need you to wait. God didn't show up in that moment. He, he gave David a conscience, an opportunity to do the right thing. See, David needed to pay attention in that moment to the tension in his heart, and he made the choice to obey. In that moment, he surrendered to God's way. And what was the result? Well, David, we now know he refused to take matters into his own hands. He chose to obey God's way, even though that he would suffer more, he would suffer more death threats, he would have the opportunity to kill Saul again, and he spared his life again. And David would become the greatest king in Israel's history. When you and I obey God, you and I can rest assured that he's going to accomplish his purpose for us no matter what. So here's how I want to end today. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for two groups of people. Maybe some of you have been following Jesus for a long time or just for a short while, but you're faced with a tough decision. You're faced with, do I need to obey God or do I need to listen to what everybody else is telling me? Because you're going to have a defining moment in your life, and I can point to a few in my life where I probably would have felt better in the moment had I listened to the expectations and the assumptions of other people, even people that I loved, and just followed their way and what they thought. But in that moment, I had to choose to obey God. And you know what? It didn't get easier. It got harder. It got tougher. But I I learned a valuable lesson. I'm going to choose to obey God, and I'm going to leave all the consequences of what happens. I'm going to leave that to him. Because now I trust him. And when he asks me to do something, I still may be reserved about it and still overly process it and overly think about it, but I I trust him, so I'm going to obey him. I want that for some of you. Maybe for some of you, you need to say, yes, I need to do that. There's tension in my heart about this decision. There's there's an opportunity for me to do my own thing, but I know I need to do God's thing. I want to be able to tell a good story. I want to have a good testimony for my children and my grandchildren, for those who will one day follow Jesus. Let me pray for you first. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be like David and obey you in the moment because we have a good relationship with you already. Help us to pay attention to any tension that might be in our heart, to follow you, to not step into what we want, but to be obedient to you, even if it means our suffering and hardships. Because God, we know that we will become more mature, not lacking anything. We choose to follow you. So help us today to listen to you, and to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to pray for another group of people who may be watching today that this is your first time maybe even being around church, and it's more comfortable to be online, and I get that, and we hope to meet you in person one day, but maybe you haven't even chosen to follow Jesus, and you don't have a great story to tell, or or you just aren't sure what your story is. You don't have purpose, and you want to obey God because you want to have him accomplish his purpose for your life. Well, that choose that's that choice has to happen today that you choose to follow Jesus. And it's a real simple choice, but it's a life-changing choice. Best choice you could ever make. So I, I want for you what David had is that he became as a person who knew God and obeyed him and God blessed his life. 
And if you want that today and you want to follow Jesus and say, you know what, my way is not working. My choices haven't been working. I've been trying to force my own thing and it's just not working. I want you to follow Jesus. So I want to pray with you and pray for you. You can repeat after me, agree with me. And and I want you to make the choice today to follow Jesus. Would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus. Thank you for helping me to realize that maybe my way is not the best way. I, I ask for forgiveness for some choices that I've made, for some wrong things that I've done that are weighing heavy on my heart. I'm realizing now that my way is not the best way, and I want your way. I believe and I confess with my mouth that you are God, that, that there's something about today, there's something about this message, God, I'm realizing that you're real and that you have something for me, and I want that. So I confess that I've done wrong things and I ask for you to forgive me. And from this day forward, I want to choose to follow you. Help me to listen to your voice and to the tension in my heart as I choose to follow your way from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, friend, if you prayed that prayer, we're so excited for you. We would love to partner with you to get you a Bible, to get you plugged into our church and and teach you how to follow Jesus because things are going to change for you now because you've chose to obey God. And for those of you that are following Jesus, I pray that today marks the start of an obedient life, no matter what may come your way, because when we pay attention to the tension in our hearts, God's will is going to be accomplished for us. We're so thankful that you joined us today. If you'd like to listen to messages like this in our series, previous messages, or months before this, or check out what our church is doing or what we believe, you can always visit our website at newcityde.org, and you can find all kinds of information on there, ways to connect with us, and and, and things that, that might interest you about different ministries that we offer. We also want to let you know that as restrictions are continually being, continually being lifted, we do offer in-person worship services every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., and, and we would really love to see you. We, we still work hard to create a safe place, but there's nothing like gathering with the people of God. Gathering online is special, but gathering together in the sanctuary of the church with other believers and worshiping together is really what God has for us. And so we would invite you to come Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. We have an adult service. We also have a kid's service. And we would just love to get to know you and, and plug you into our church and help you follow Jesus. So we hope to see you. And thanks for joining us today. God bless you and have a great day.